this uh, this one will be called the pursuit of expectation part 21 we've been talking about Elijah and Elisha and and in this series if you will Elijah is Jesus Christ and Elisha is the church following <laughs> him wheresoever he goes he takes him to these three towns these these cities Gilgal, Bethel, and Jericho. Now what these are, these are three understandings, three comprehensions. You must go to Gilgal, and you can't get from Gilgal until, you can't get from Gilgal to Bethel until Gilgal is comprehended. And then you can't, once you get to Bethel, you can't get to Jericho until Bethel is comprehended. And you can't move on to the Jordan and see the Lord taken up until you comprehend Jericho. And now this is Old Testament, guys, uh, but I want to tell you what, it's the same for us today. Now, in, in when Moses brought them out to the wilderness, when that cloud moved, they had to move. But here's the other thing of that. They couldn't move until the cloud moved. That was just as important. And if you'll go look, you'll see that each one of these places they went was an understanding, a comprehension. Now, now we brought it down to three. Now, this number three in scriptures means fullness. It's the fullness of him who filleth all in all. It's Jesus Christ. Seven's the number of perfection. Three's the number of fullness. Three feasts. Actually, if you guys didn't know this, there's seven feasts. Uh, those, the fullness of those seven feasts are three feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, but the fullness of all those feasts is one, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Same thing right here, his death, burial, and resurrection, three. That's the fullness. It's not only death, but there's a burial, not only a burial, a resurrection. Now, we've been going over this Bethel for a long, long time because why is Bethel so important? Because this is the place, people don't understand this, where the Son of Man appears. He's not going to appear over here in Walmarts or appear in the eastern sky somewhere. He's going to appear in his body, which is the church. I don't know if a lot of people really get that, but, let me, you know, in Galatians 5, he says, if you live in the Spirit... So walk ye in the Spirit. Now think about this. If you live in the Spirit, what he's saying is if you live in another realm, I get my mail at Cedar Bluff because my mail comes from the earthly realm. But I don't live in Cedar Bluff. I live in Him. That's a, you see, I'm telling you guys, this has got to be... You know what truth is? Truth is when this becomes reality in you. Yeah, I get my mail at Cedar Bluff. And according to the earth, that's where I live. But according to the heaven, I live in him. Let me give you a couple verses here in Ephesians 3, 16. That he would grant you, that he, Christ, would grant you, you got to get this, guys. You got to understand this. This is Paul's prayer. My God, this is my prayer for you. I hope it's your prayer for me that God would grant you. Now, He's going to grant you according to something. Now, now this is very important, guys. I, he didn't just grant you something, He does it according. Now, this is how He grants according to the riches of His glory. Now, let me just tell you, let me break this down to you in, in Jim Moore. Uh, let's just say money. Out of my account, I would have to do it according to my account. So I couldn't give Clive at about $14. <laughs> because I'm doing it according to my account. Christ here, God our Father, is doing it according to his account. He got a little more than $14. You, you understand what I'm saying? Now, when he gives, he gives according 
to his riches in glory. And I wonder who the riches in his glory is. My Lord and my God, he gives you his blessed son. But now listen to this. He does this to be strengthened with might by his spirit. Where at? In the inner man. That Christ... Now listen, guys, we got to, why is he blessing you with the riches of his glory? Why is he doing that? Because, oh, I like Holy Guy, and Holy Guy's having a rough time. There's a purpose here, guys. There's a purpose for this whole thing. God doesn't just do something and say, well, let's just do it. There's a reason. Right here it is, if you'll see this, this moves me out of the center. He ain't blessing me because he just loves me. That puts me as the end. It's like we talked about, Kathy. I'm not the end of anything. He's the end. He's the beginning. He's the end. He blesses me in the middle. Why? To get to this end. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That, be, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Why? Because Christ dwells in your heart by faith may be able to comprehend, because see, you can't comprehend this, but by him dwelling there, maybe, just maybe there's a sight chance, you might be able to get, begin, be able to comprehend with, with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of of God. And what what we've been talking about with Christ the head, that he filleth all in all. Yeah. See why he blesses you? So that you may be filled with his son. Yeah. You remember remember John in the book of Revelation? He, he looks at those candlesticks, and in the midst of those candlesticks, what does he see? One likened it to the Son of Man in the midst of those candlesticks. <coughs> so he his eyes come off of the candlestick. He doesn't give you a description of the candlesticks. He's giving you a description of the Son of Man. How beautiful he is. His hair, his feet, the girl with clothes he's wearing. Even what words come out of his mouth, sharper than a two-edged sword. Now, where does he appear? Amongst the candlesticks. Where's the candlestick? He appears in his holy temple. This that he started out here in the, in the design back in Moses. See to it, Moses, that you make it according to the pattern that I will show thee, that I will give you revelation of. That's what show means. I'm going to reveal this to you. And you see to it that you make it exactly according to that pattern. Don't you dare move this ark one foot more forward. It, or this, this uh, altar. It better not be one inch too big or one inch too small. It's exactly got to be. Why? Because it is going to represent my son. This is going to be a testimony of him. When you make that veil right there, here's what I want you to put on that veil. I don't want to put your stars and all this other stuff. It better have the cherubim on there. Here's exactly how you're going to do this candlestick. Not one too big, not one too small, but exactly one beaten work. It's, why? Because it's a testimony of my son. You're going to see how all this is going to play out here in a few minutes. You stay with me today. Because I'm going to take you through something. I'm, just going, to, I'm going to give you a speedboat ride today. Speedboat ride. Now why does he appear in his, in his church, in his holy temple? For the transforming of his holy temple. What's the order in which he does that? Y'all stay with me here. I mean, you were looking at the book of Revelation. John was immediately taken into the heavens, wasn't he? He saw the Son of Man in the church. Then what happens? He gets taken immediately into heaven. You go read the book of Revelation. Come up here and I'll show you things. He brought him right slap dab to the throne. And there in the throne, what did he see? You guys, I'm going to tell you what, guys. You take somebody who is, you bring them out of the world and put them into the church. Baptize them in the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to do. Put them in the church, give them a membership card, tell them to go home and start reading the book of Ephesians. Where are they going to go? 
They're going to go to the book of Revelation, guys. So I'm just telling you, go into the book of Revelation. That's the first book's always read. Anybody that ever reads a book, you always go to the last chapter, don't you? We always go to the book of Revelation. It'll get you all messed up. Because it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He takes John. He, John sees him in the church. John is taken immediately into the heavens. And then he starts seeing this revelation unfold. And I'm going to tell you what, guys. It wasn't a pretty picture. It was devastating. I'm just going to be honest with you. The revelation of Jesus Christ is devastating to the flesh. I, I don't care. I can't. I just can't butter this up and make it any pretty. He takes away the first that he might establish the second. John sees all this unfold. I don't know about you, but my heart longs for that. I mean, I've saw glimpses of this, guys. I have saw glimpses so bright that you can't keep your eyes on it very long. I'm telling you what, guys. Go outside on a, on a beautiful day and try to look at the sun and see how long you can stare at it. You can't. And I'm telling you what, this glory that overwhelmed Paul was brighter than the noonday sun. I'm telling you, this glory, just a glimpse of it, just the weight of it, just the presence of it. I mean, people talk about a little weak God. They have never even got a glimpse of them, Clyde. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, we better do this and get to, this country's going to hell and all that. They ain't seen my Lord and my Savior. I'm telling you what. They don't have a clue of his power. I mean, when Jesus was here in the flesh and they come to get him in the garden, they come out to get him. We're coming to get Jesus. Where is he at? And then Jesus said, whom seek ye? Now, these are mighty Roman Sanhedrin guards right here out there with swords. Trained killers fell over on their hind ends backwards. Just, just at the very softness of his voice. Who are you looking for? In the quiet of the night, who are you looking for? They got a little glimpse of him. They fell over on their hind ends backwards. And I'm, I'm telling you what. There's going to be a manifestation of him that's going to knock some things over backwards. I can promise you it is. It's, it, it's done it in my heart. Believe you me, I come at him with all my knowledge and all my glory, and he knocked it flat on his tail, the head in one place, and the body in another place, and the arms and legs fell off. You know what I'm talking about, an old Dagon that was right in here. <laughs> he, he can't stand in the presence. He, he reveals him in his house. Now, I, I, I've got to hurry here because I got, like I said, I got some stuff I got to show you. So the only way that we are going to understand the church is in the revealing of the Son in the church. Understanding the church's oneness, union with him in the heavens. You know what all that is, guys? And I'm not going to go into details, but that's the ark. This ark that is made out of a beaten piece of gold. One piece with the cherubims right on top. They didn't bolt the cherubims on. They're one piece. Do, do you understand what I'm talking about? They're one piece. This ark represents the new creation. It was veiled from them. They couldn't see the new creation. Why? Because there was a veil. What was on the veil? The cherubim. It pointed to it, but all they could see was an imagination of the new creation. But the veil's done away in Christ. Behold, the new is here. Behold, I make all things new. You want to see the new creation? Here I am. And where are you? You're his body. You're the body of that new creation. And you know what, guys? Israel, the church, his body, could only move in view of the new creation. Could they not? Set the ark about 2,000 cubits right out in front of them and move. He didn't say hide the ark so that they can't see it. But see, it was hid from for a long time in the wilderness. But when they come into the land, set the ark out in front of them. Why? So every knee shall bow. And every time, set it out where they can see it. I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling. The mark's got to be put out in front of them. That mark is Jesus Christ of whom you are his body. Why? Because he dwells in you. If you live in the spirit, 
walk in the Spirit. We see here in John, and I told you about this a little bit last week, the church, the first part of the book, he sees the church, the revealing of the candlesticks, but at the end, the transformation takes place in the heavens. The church is now coming down as a bride, as a wife, as the body of Christ. She comes down into the earth. Now the church is not seven golden candlesticks, but a beautiful wife adorned in glory, adorned in all the jewels and the majesty on high. Adorned not with jewels, but with the splendor and the glory of the Lord himself. Yeah, it's called jewels and and opals and all sapphires and all them other things, but it is the Lord himself. She comes down dressed in him. Paul would say it this way, put ye on Christ. Why am I telling you this? Because we must look in the heavens, in the spirit where we live. We must look there in order to realize the purpose, the scope, the depth, the breadth, the length, the depth, the height of our reality of life here in the earth. We look in the earth to try to find our purpose. You're never going to find it. You're never going to find it. We've got to look in the heavens. We've got to look in Him. Because the heavens is where you live. Think about this, guys. And this, this may be a small way to put it. Y'all know I work on the railroad. I work on the railroad, work in the railroad, whatever you want to talk about. I don't live there. You manifest everything here in this world. You got your home down there in Castlewood and Berwyn and all these other places, but that is where you will say work. Where you live is in the spirit in Christ. So everywhere you go, it's like me going to work. Everything I do and everything, that's not where I live. I live in Christ. But I manifest everything from my home, the clothes I wear, the language I use, the food I bring with me, everything I do is manifested in that place out here. You, you, do you, you understand what I'm, what I'm telling you? It's hard for people to understand that you live in the Spirit. These things are important because we've got to come to, the, to some decisions. And these decisions are not going to be made in the, on the earth. They're going to be made in the heavens. And let me tell you why this is important because as God continues to reveal His Son in you, it is going to become increasingly difficult to remain in a tomb. Let me tell you something. A tomb is for something that's dead, not something that's alive. You can't keep him in a tomb. Sooner or later, we're going to, we have to come forth as the body of his resurrection. He has no other body. You're it. Sooner or later, we have to come into that truth that we are the body of his resurrection. This is only going to be uh, uh, manifested when we open our eyes where we live in the heavens. He's speaking out from that place. What well, did we say faith? How does faith come? Faith cometh by hearing. When John began to hear, he turned to see. And he saw the Son of Man, and immediately he's in the Spirit, brought up into the throne, and he sees it all start to unfold. Paul said, I'm praying that God would grant you according to his riches in glory, not in some place, but in glory, his Son, that you might begin to comprehend. I mean, what do you think he's talking about? This breadth, the length, the depth, the height. He's talking about a four-square city. A four-square city, which is the bride of Christ, which you are. Four-square, not lacking in anything. What do you mean? Fullness of him. Not short-sighted anywhere. I mean, 
mean, it's got to be that way, guys. It's got to be the body of his resurrection. And as you come in your understanding of this, you're going to have to live as the church of his resurrection in the earth. The stone rolled away. The earth's going to quake whenever the stone's rolled away, guys. It quakes mightily. You got to shed the grave clothes. All of us, guys, got to shed the grave clothes. It's the husk. But let me tell you something. Here, here's what happens, guys. Here's what happens. Many would rather get new pews for the tomb. They'd rather repaint the tomb, call it a church. But it's still a tomb. But let me tell you something, guys. And this brings joy to my heart. The tomb has accomplished its purpose. So I'm looking around at a lot. I'm not talking about you guys, but I know I come out of a tomb. I don't know where you come from, but I know I come out of a tomb. And you all, if you ain't come out of a tomb yet, you need to go in one. Because you can't outwalk as the body of his resurrection until you've been in a tomb. Because we were crucified with him, we're buried with him, and we're buried where? In a tomb. Why? We bury the dead out of our sight so that only he comes forth in resurrection. Yes. I'm telling you, uh, look at Hebrews here, here real quick. Now I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to get into something. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. You remember what Jesus did with the grave clothes? Y'all remember the napkin? Where, what, what, and why, what position was the napkin in? Was it folded up and laid over there? I mean, you guys know that. Y'all read that. I don't have to pull out them scriptures on you. Hebrews verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remain. What shall perish? We just said the heavens are the works of thy hands, and they shall perish, but thou remainest. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ here. And they shall wax old, as doeth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up. And they shall be changed. He, you see, guys, he took that napkin that was where? Laid upon his face. Folded it up as a vesture. And left it in the tomb along with his grave clothes. Now, guys, there was a purpose for some things to be put off in that tomb. There's a lot of people going down there checking in that tomb for grave clothes and they will find evidence of his death. But here's the question I told you last week. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He's not here. He don't live in a tomb. He is not here. He is what? Risen. <coughs> Did Paul not tell us you are raised up with him? Seated together? In heavenly places we're at in Christ Jesus. Oh my God. See, there's going to be a tangible manifestation of Christ in the earth as the reality of Him fills up the heavens. Remember, there was an old heaven, an old earth. Go read it in Revelation. That old heaven and old earth done away. No more sea. I saw new heavens, a new earth. The old one fall around to you. He folded that heaven up as a vesture right there in the tomb. Folded, folded all them grave clothes, throw them down, fold that napkin up that was over his face. Everything that veiled his glory left it laying right there. You can go there and find them grave clothes. People's got the shroud of Christ out there somewhere, don't they? With blood on it. They got a, this holy garment that's of Jesus Christ. That ain't Christ. Maybe it was his garment. I don't know. I don't care. 
I don't care. I don't care if they find the cross that he was crucified on. If that cross ain't in you, as a living reality of the person himself, it's useless. It's just two sticks of wood. You, you see what I'm talking about? I'm sure that shroud is somewhere in some museum and millions of people go look at it. Millions of people this morning are going looking for that shroud. In whatever denomination, whatever place they're in, they're looking for some evidence of his death. But I'm talking to a people who realize, who in truth yeah. have been caught up into the heavens, yeah. and the heavens are filling their reality. Why? So that they can come down and manifest this reality right here in the earth. Hallelujah. Not a shroud. You go over there if you want the shroud. This is the real deal. Yes, Hallelujah. This is the real deal. Real deal. You know, when I think of real deal, I think of the real deal, holy field. The real deal. The real deal. In, in order to stay in the tomb, you have to stop the heavenly vision. I'm going to tell you what, guys. I've been talking to people. And as they're coming along in this vision, we'll get to a point when you start talking what I'm talking about. We don't want no more of that, Clyde. I like to be covered in this shroud. I like it over here in this tomb. I got my walls around me. It's dark in a tomb. I got the protection of the stone in front of me. I've seen churches right down the road here. Got a big stone out here with the Ten Commandments right on it. And I'm thinking, yeah, you want to roll that stone right up in front of the door, right up in front of the tomb. But I'm talking a place where the stone is rolled away. Mightily. Guys, there was an earthquake there. There was guards right there, too. And there's guards in every one of them places. And when they go to look in, what are they going to say? Well, you must have stolen him, Clyde. I know we put him in here. Now, them disciples over there, they must have stolen him away. I, I really, I, don't, I didn't really see you put him in here. I don't know if he was really ever here. We've got to come up with some kind of lie because we can't explain him not being here. But the church, the, the, the people know he ain't here. They know all they got is grave clothes and they're waiting on him to what? Come back. See, I ain't preaching a tomb theology because I don't live there. We live in the spirit. We don't live in a tomb. The two don't go together. They're an oxymoron if you, I don't know if I'm using that word right, you don't live in a tomb. You die. You put there when you die. But I got news for you guys. I was buried with him. When you were baptized into him, you were baptized into his death. Yeah. And your old heavens was folded up like a vesture. And you're in that place for three days. Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, death, burial, resurrection. You see, you see. All right. A tomb cannot hold the body of his resurrection. Let's go. Let's go look at a problem here. Now I'm going to show you. Let's go to John, uh, chapter two. Here, here, Jesus has just turned the water into wine. Boy, we preach that water into wine. Now listen, to, I'm in John chapter 2, verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum. Now remember, he's just turned the water into wine. He goes, now look at the direction. Where, which way is he going, up or down? Do you guys know when people talk? Does, I don't know, here's a little side note. Do, do people talk to you? And, and guys are big on this. I don't know, women probably not because... Morgan always messes it up. If I was to go to Bluefield, I would say I'm going up to Bluefield. Or if I was going to Georgia, I would say we're going down to Georgia, right? Morgan always says I'm going down to Bluefield. I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm trying to work, but maybe that's a woman thing, I don't know. Derek, he's going, yeah, yeah, he knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, I'm going up to Bluefield. Or going, or something's equal, I'm going over to Roanoke. Or out to roll it. You see what I mean? It's just direction. Well, in Scripture, look at this direction here. He's going down to Capernaum. He just done these miracles. 
He's going down. Isn't it, 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 if you'll see with the place, just look where Jesus' miracles are performed out from where and all this. He goes down to Capernaum. He and his mother and his brethren and his disciples. They continued there not many days. Now, the Jews' Passover was at hand. You all know the rules here. Laid out back here when he handed this. Three times a year, all the males, everybody there shall come up. Which way? Up to Jerusalem. Not come out, not come over. Come up to Jerusalem. I, and you know the Lord said, guys, I know you may have crops in the field and, and livestock and everything, but I will protect everything you got if you obey this and you come up to Jerusalem. Without fail, you better come up. Now remember when Jesus was born, just naturally so, there was, uh, and I don't believe he was born in December, that's irrelevant. I believe he was born in Feast of Tabernacles, whatever, up there in September somewhere. But there was no place for him, no room in the inn. Now, yes, that has a spiritual metaphor, but the reason being is because they were honoring this, and everybody had came to Jerusalem for the feast. They didn't have Holiday Inn Express and Motel 6 and all that other stuff. They lived with other people wherever. It was crowded. But anyway, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Remember, he's down in Capernaum. He's going up to Jerusalem. And what's second place? Passover, right? Do y'all see anything wrong with this verse right here? I mean, just, just look at it. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. I'm going to tell you what, guys. There's a major problem right here. Because it's the Jews' Passover. In, in the book of Leviticus, these are all called the Feast of the Lord, not the Jews. There's a problem here. Jesus is going up to Jerusalem. There's a major problem going on. This has no longer become the Feast of the Lord. It's their feast. They have made it their own. Something's not in order here. Something's bad wrong. I mean, is this not a problem in the earth today? That which at one time exemplified the Lord. Make it according to the pattern. Because this is a testimony of my son. Has now become the feast of the Jews. I mean... At one time it exemplified the Lord, but now it's just exemplifying a tradition, a ministry. They don't feed the people the, the word which he is. They hear about him, but they are not made to be partakers of the word which he is. Now, now listen, guys. I just got to get real simple with you. Why can... They not feed the word which he is to the people. Now think about it. Look. This is just real simple. But if I was to feed y'all these mints, and I'm not giving up none of my mints, but if I was to share, and I don't believe in sharing, but just for example, something required for me to do that. These mints must be here. And if I'm preaching that Jesus is way over yonder in glory land someday, there is no earthly way I could feed you the bread which he is. In order to give you the bread, I must have the bread. Why you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. And unless you eat the true bread, which he is, you're eating a substitute. And you cannot be changed into the image, which he is. Do y'all see what I'm saying? Yes, yes. 
In order to feed you the word, the word must be here. Not about him. I'm not telling you things about him, guys. I'm talking about the Lord Jesus Christ who lives in you, which you are his very body. Eat my flesh, not a representation of it. Okay. A representation of it is the Jews' feast. All right? All right. I mean, I hear the Lord, why do you continue to eat that which is not me? Why do you seek that which is not me? Why are you as my body trying to bring me back into the tomb? We can no longer keep our knowing in the heaven. We must become a manifestation in the earth. Sooner or later, guys, you do not light a candle and put it under a bushel or put it under a bed. Where does the where do you put the candle? On the candlestick. Wait a minute. Did not John see in the midst of the candlestick one likened it to the Son of Man? Right in the midst of that, you cannot hide this candlestick. It must be put in the church. He said, he said, you know, let me just go read it to you here real quick, real quick, so, so you can see. Revelation uh, 2, 5. Remember therefore from which thou art fallen. And repent and do thy first works. If you don't do this, remember what he said, I'll come and take the candlestick away. Your, I'll move your lamp away. Remember from whence thou art fallen and repent from the first love. And boy, I've preached this and I've heard it preached. You've got to get back to your first love, Derek. You've got to get back to your first love. Right? I'm thinking, what the heck does that mean? Because my first love with this little girl in the first grade, I thought it was the most beautiful thing in the world. You know, her little name was Cindy. Boy, she was it. I used to blow her kisses, right? Roses are red, violets are blue. You know. Yeah. I love you and all this other stuff. If you like me, check. You, did you ever make them little notes? Check yes or no. Oakley's still writing them kind of notes. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. I'm thinking, what the heck does this mean, first love? Where did I tell you you live? You live in him in heaven, who is the love of Christ with passes all knowledge. That's the love you have to go back to, not a thing, not a feeling, but the love who Jesus is himself. Yes, yes. Do, do you see what I'm saying? And, and he says that... Remember from whence thou art fallen. Now what does this mean, fallen? It means you fall from heavenly thoughts. You're seated with him in heavenly places. Paul said, set your affections on things above. If you be risen with Christ, do this. Go read Philippians, you'll see. Consider this, is what he said. Think on these things. Think on wisdom. Think on righteousness. Think on, get your thoughts in heavenly. When your thoughts aren't heavenly, you've fallen. You see what I'm talking about. And what happens when you're fallen and you stay there? Immediately he comes and takes the candlestick away. He removes the light. I mean, a candlestick is for what? A candle, right? I mean, you know, if this was a... a, 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 a I mean, we got a microphone. This microphone stand's purpose is for what? The microphone. <laughs> It don't serve no other purpose. So the candlestick, we don't preach the candlestick. It's one purpose. It's for the candle that goes in it, the light. Yes. The Lord is the lamp. He's the light. We're the lampstand. He's the head. We're the body. Now listen, the legitimacy of the lampstand is to bear the light. If it doesn't bear the light, it has no reason to be in existence. Right? I mean, I'm not going to, there's no need to just have this up here with no microphone in it. It's just in the way. Get rid of it. But it serves a purpose now. I can sing into it. Not very well, mind you, but I can sing into it and do all the things that I do in it. But if this is gone, this thing here is useless. 
It's, you, it's worthless. What am I going to do? Pinch my ear with it and just hang right there? No, sir, no purpose. Heaven in the earth. Huh? Amen. Huh? You can't operate a cell phone. Can't read, can't write. Yeah, in the beginning. All right, now back over here in John. Remember, it's the Jews' Passover is at hand. Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. Now, as he goes up to Jerusalem, guys, let me let me show you something. Go with me to Galatians. Now we're going to speed boat right here, okay? Go with me to Galatians. Galatians chapter 4. I believe it's chapter 4. All right, verse uh, 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondmaid, the other by the free woman. <coughs> He that was of the bond woman was born out to the flesh, but he that are of uh, the free woman by promise. Which things are an allegory? Y'all know what that means, an allegory. The one from Mount... Uh, for these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar or Hagar. This Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Did... Did not Lazarus come forth in bondage, guys? Was he not wrapped up, loose him, and let him go in the tomb? But Jerusalem, which is above, is free and the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not, break forth and cry. Thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she with has a husband. Now remember, he's going out to Jerusalem, but there's it looks to me like there's two Jerusalems here. There's a Jerusalem which now is with genders to bondage and a heavenly Jerusalem. One of them is celebrating the feast of the Jews. The other one is celebrating the feast of the Lord. Earthly Jerusalem is preaching earthly things. It's built around ministries rather than the measure of all ministries. And this Jerusalem, this earthly Jerusalem, is cranking out disciples and new members every day. She's bearing children, right? Boom, boom, having babies, having babies, having babies. Look at these churches grow. Watch them grow. Had 22 saved this Sunday. Got 14 more saved last Sunday. Going to baptize 116 this Sunday, right? Earthly Jerusalem. I just read it to you in Galatians. She has, I mean, let, let me go back and read it. Now, I'll, I'll stick my little book in there so you can, you can read it here. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. So we got, we got one Jerusalem here that's barren. Right? And, and we got the other one, the one that's in bondage, is called the desolate. She's got many more children. Well, for the desolate hath many more children than she would have done. What he's saying here is, guys, there's going to be a change. That this desolate... It's going to have more children than she which is in bondage, than she that has a husband. Now, wait a minute. Who is Jerusalem, earthly Jerusalem's husband? That's a question, isn't it? Because earthly Jerusalem is married to somebody, and there's a heavenly Jerusalem married to somebody. Well, let me just ask you. Y'all know who Rachel and Leah was? Y'all know who Rebecca and or Sarah and Hagar was? Now, let me ask you a question. Who was Hagar's husband? Abraham. Who was Rebekah's husband? Or Sarah's husband? <coughs> All right. Who was Leah's husband? Who was Rachel's husband? Ah, they're both married to Jesus Christ. <laughs> now, that blows your mind, don't it? But one is after an earthly view... One must be folded up and done away. Paul says, we know no man after the flesh anymore. Yes, they're married to him. They preach about Jesus. 
They talk about Jesus. One of these days they're going to see Jesus. They are married to him, but not in truth. And they've been cranking out babies left and right. Go read Hannah. Did, didn't her husband have two wives? One of them was cranking out babies. That was Hannah's whole prayer, that she would have a child. Wasn't that uh, Sarah's whole thing, that she would have a child? Wasn't that Rachel's whole thing, that she would have? These are the barren, guys. This is who you are. The heavenly side. Yeah, Leah's cross-eyed over there, and she's cranking out babies left and right. <laughs> You know, on that side, they got ten kids. On this side over here, Rachel, she brings forth this little guy named Joseph. I wonder who Joseph is. You see what I'm saying? Mm. The difference, guys, is Christ himself. And they may have more children right now, but it won't always be that way. He says, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Your children will be more than she with has a husband. And I'm talking more not only in numbers but in fullness. I'm talking you could have one bringing forth Jesus Christ and you can have 20,000 over here bringing forth themselves. I want the one coming forth in the fullness of him. Now, I'm talking... I believe he just told Abraham, count the stars in the heaven if you can. Count the grands of saying, that so shall thy seed be. That seed which is Christ. You, you see, uh, you see that one is bringing forth, the, and their ministries are more preeminent than the one they minister. Why do you think I spent four, five, six weeks talking about the preeminence of Jesus Christ, who is the head of all things? The difference is Christ. Remember, he goes up to Jerusalem. He finds the feast of the Jews, not the, not the feast of the Lord. And look what it says, and found in the temple... In the midst of that which is called Jerusalem, he finds in the, the temple, in the earthly Jerusalem, the earthly system, that earthly, uh, I mean, he goes up to Jerusalem and what does he find in the midst of it? Does he find a heaven re reality? Or does he find him that's sold? I mean, I mean which, do you think he's not going to appear in his church. Guys, come on. we got to get real. He is going to appear in his church. That's where he is going to appear. Like it or not, it is irrelevant. Whether you like it or not, he is going to appear in his church. What's he going to find when he shows up? Remember, he found in his temple. He's going up to Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. But he finds in there an earthly reality. It's a feast of the Jews. They're celebrating their own feast. They're buying and selling. They're doing all these things they're not supposed to be doing. The temple, guys, is who you are, right? The temple is who you are. And let me keep reading. And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and dove, doves and changers of money. The temple, he finds in this temple a people who are merchandising one another. What does that mean? These, these people that are doing this are enemies of the cross. Their God is their own belly who mind earthy things. Why? I mean, you know what Jude would say? Uh, well, we'll go, we'll, we'll, we'll go read that here in a minute. See what the Lord is doing? He's driving out the things which were substituting for him. Look at it. They got sheep. They got oxen. They got doves. Everything that they are supposed to have in the temple, they have it. Well, what didn't they have? Him. Here's what God says. Keep the Ten Commandments. Well, good. That's a substitute for Him who is the reality. Oh, we got our ceremonies, and we got our baptism, and we got our rites and our, our communion services. That's good. You've done what you were supposed to do, but now I'm here. 
Those things got to go. The reality, and that's the whole ministry of Jesus. They were looking for the Messiah. He said, behold, I am he. The one you're looking for. The I am from the beginning. Greater than Solomon is here. I am the son of David, the bright morning star. Nah, they didn't like that because they wanted to be the son. They wanted to be the owner of the vineyard, did they not? They wanted to be the daggone light instead of the candlestick. He told them, what do you think this guy's going to do? He said, I'm going to send my son to him. They'll reverence him. And behold, what do they do? Hey, here comes the heir. Let's kill him and take the vineyard for ourselves. Hmm. Listen, the Lord is driving out those things that are substituting for him. He drove out the doves and the, and the, and the money changers. He drove out everything they, they that sold. The whole thing was a substitute for him. The church is preaching that which is substitute for Christ. They're merchandising the people. Now listen, I've got I to gotta hit this home to you. They're presenting something other than Christ. They are promising you riches. Promising you health. Promising you a better government. Promising you heaven. Are they not promising you all these things? If you'll do this, you'll get to heaven. If you'll do this, you'll be healed. If you'll do this, you'll get rich. You'll do this, you'll do this. They bring it down to an earthly level. And they merchandise you rather than you desiring to see him be made manifested in the earth. You want to know what riches is? Let me show you him who says all souls are mine. All things are given to me of my father, the owner of everything. Now look, look, let me go to uh, Jude here real quick. And I'll show you that this Jerusalem here, Jude uh, number 16. <clears throat> These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. And their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. My, my, my. Now let me give you another one here. In, in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 23. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. He's talking this earthly Jerusalem. No more at all is this candle going to shine in thee. This candle is never going to shine again in the tomb. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be no more heard at all in thee. For thy merchants were thy great men of the earth. <coughs> For by their sorceries were all nations deceived. I will come quickly and remove thy candlestick out of its place. He goes to Jerusalem and he finds this very thing going on. And what do you think he does? Oh, guys, come here. Let me get some things right with you guys. Just sit over here. Let me teach you a little bit. He takes a whip, a scourge, a small cord. So let me tell you what this cord is. It's a threefold cord. It's a cord that can't be broken. It's the cord of faith. It's the cord made up of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. It's the cord made up of death, burial, resurrection, made up of Gilgal, Bethel, and Jericho, and he runs them out. Do, can, you with me? You with me? You understanding all that? <coughs> now, see, these guys right here, when he comes into this temple, they're not going to give him a table in this temple, are they? They're not going to give him a table in their leadership. Oh, let me let me get and you guys stay with me. We're gonna we're going we're getting somewhere here. Malachi chapter three, verse one. Behold, I will send my messenger. He shall prepare thy way before me. And the Lord whom you see, seek shall suddenly come to his temple. <coughs> this is what's happening here, guys. He's coming to his temple. What you are, whom you seek. And he shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord. He shall come. He shall come where? In his temple. He, Jesus is coming to his temple, guys. His temple, what you are. But who may abide the day of his coming? Who's going to abide?
find that, guys, because the voice of this earthly stuff is no more going to be heard at all in her. The light of the sun is no more going to be seen in her again. Who shall abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? Because he's like a refiner's fire, a full of soap. He shall set as a refiner, a purifier of silver. And the Levite, and he shall purify the sons of Levites, purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord the offering of righteousness. He's going to appear in his people, guys. He's going to appear in his church. And he comes first into you. And what's he do? He brings his faith in. Yes. Yes. And he scourges his temple and gets rid of that earthly stuff. Come up here there, John. And what did John see? John saw wonderful things. And then John began to weep. Did he not? He saw the church. He saw the Son of Man. He saw the throne and all this. And then what did he see? John began to weep. Why? Because I saw something there that was sealed up. No man was able to open it up. It was sealed up. And I said, my God, I've seen all these wonderful things. But this, my friends, I'm weeping. Heaven is crying. Somebody's got to say, John, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals. You know, I could just see John saying, hooray, hooray. And as these seals began to be opened in him, the sea became as blood. Oh, God Almighty, I know exactly what, you know, Patty, know. the sea become, the third part of the trees was burned up. Everything I worship, guys, is brought to destruction. This, You see, I was living by my faith. Yes, yes. But we must come from faith of Clyde to the faith of the Son. And when we do that, He scourges in that temple. He purges in that temple. At the revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, I heard him say to the four angels, hold back the winds just yet because I have got to reserve because I'm looking for the inner man. Yeah. I've got to destroy all this outer man because I'm going to fold it up as a vesture. Who shall be able to stand in the day of his coming? Who shall be able to stand, bear the day of his appearing? You see, this appearing is going to be appearing in the earth. You see what, you see what I'm talking about, guys? I told you we was going on a speedboat ride, didn't I? There's going to be a massive revealing of him in the heavens. So there can be a massive manifestation of him in the earth. That's the whole purpose of it, guys. Now what does they say back over here in John? He goes in, he does that, and they, and they say, no, wait a minute, Jesus. I know you're the son of Joseph over here. By what authority do you do this? And show us a sign that you have the authority to even do that. Now just wait a minute. Because I know I've been a Pharisee my whole life. And I know the order of these things. I know the order given to Moses. And you walk up in here and run everybody out. Heck, you ain't even a Levite. You can't even come in here. You're the tribe of Judah. Only the Levites can come in here. You see, he's doing away with that priesthood. Oh, yeah. There's a brand new order. He's doing away not with leadership, but the order of it. Because right. he's changing the order of this yeah. priesthood. He had all rights to be in there. Because there's a brand new order. Go read Hebrews and you'll see about this brand new order. Just stay with me. Give us a sign. This is what he's going to say to you too. Look, look what he says right here. They answered and said, what sign do you show us seeing that you do these things? And Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days raise it up. Here's your sign. Yeah. Here's your sign. I'm going to destroy it and raise it up again in three days. Where's the authority? You see, the first thing is, is this temple must be destroyed. It must be. And this temple, you know, he spake of his body. This temple that's representing him was representing his body. And he says, I must destroy this thing. Why? Because everything that represents me must be destroyed in the reality of me. Oh, yes. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah, I mean, it'd be like us having a picture of Jesus up here. And we're saying, this is what Jesus looks like. But when he is here, we throw the pictures away. You see? 
Stay with me, guys. I'm almost finished. Remember, he takes away the first that he may establish the second in its place. I mean, he says, I'm going to take, I'm going to destroy this temple so that I can bring forth a brand new one. All the things the temple represents, all the sacrifices, all the orders, all the priesthood, everything, the candlesticks, everything in here, everything, the walls, the cherubims, the bread, the manna, the sacrifices, the fire, the wood, the walls, the door, everything's got to go. Yeah. Why? So that I can raise it up again. So that I can raise it up again. What do you mean destroy it? Now listen, he didn't just come to destroy it. That's just throwing your power around. I'm destroying it on the authority that I'm going to raise it up again. Do you see the difference? Yes. Here's why I can tear it down, because I'm rebuilding it. Yes. Oh, yeah, let me tell you something, because I can knock this building down and raise it up again. Yes. Don't you never think I can, because I'm the owner of this thing. Yes. I don't like what represents me, so I'm going to raise it up in my place. He comes forth in the body of his resurrection. I told you guys, we got to get coming where we're coming forth in his resurrection. You see? By what authority? They're going to ask you that too. By what authority do you do these things? Because you're going to be the threefold cord, guys. You are the threefold cord. You are the one in his manifestation that's going to purge these things. I mean, what was the prayer? Oh, it's on everybody's refrigerators. It's on everybody's wall. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in the heavens. My God, where are you called? You're raised up in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And it must come forth in the earth. Oh, Lord. I told you we was going on a speedboat ride today, didn't I? Speedboat ride today. You know what that sign is, God? They said, what sign do you do this? The sign is the cross. The sign that is coming in the earth is the cross. And what does that mean? It's not something you got hung around your neck. It's a people who understand they have no life but Christ. It's a people who understand I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, you, you, see, you see what I'm talking, guys? The church has become a visible manifestation of the invisible Christ. What authority by His death, His burial, His resurrection? Our authority for doing away with the things that only represents Him comes only when we become a manifestation of Him. Three days I'll raise it up. He takes away that he may establish. The house that represents him is destroyed. The house that you are, which the house that is him, is raised up in its place. It's raised up as him. Let me just give you one last verse. Go to 1 John chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not. It ain't manifested yet. He ain't showed up in the earthly Jerusalem yet. Now I'm saying he ain't showed up in it. Because they knew him not, they don't know us. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doeth, ne doeth not yet appear what we shall be. It don't appear to them what's, what's fixing to take place. But we know. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. But we know. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you what, guys. I'm right to the people that knows. Yeah. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Now listen, we ain't going to appear as some people in allegiance with Jesus. We're not going to appear as being buddies with Jesus. As he yeah. Because we are his very body, yeah. not his buddy, his body. Do you understand? We shall appear 
We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Brothers and sisters, that is Bethel. God bless you. I get out of the way, Patty.